Okay, I'm here to introduce Jan. My name is Joaquin and I lead applied research at Facebook. So every now and then in a field like machine learning, you get a small group of people who don't give up. You get a small group of people who maybe, despite trends changing very fast around them, and despite having people who move on and work on something else and look at what these other people are doing and sort of scoff at them. And I have a confession to make to you, Jan, today. I think, you know, since we're doing like, since we're coming out here in public, I'm gonna do it as well. Um, I think this must, have, this must have been the early 2000s. I was working on Gaussian processes and I am one of the people who looked at Backprop and said, what the fuck, isn't this just like a glorified name for like the chain rule? So I'm sorry, I'm one of these people. Uh, but luckily, despite, despite that environment of, of doubt and adversity, um, Jan and other colleagues of his persisted and never gave up. And I think that if today, uh, you know, deep learning is so prevalent, it's thanks to this small group of people who for almost 30 years just did not give up. Jan is going to talk about unsupervised learning today. And if you look for the abstract to his talk, there's none. So it's, it's truly an unsupervised talk. And, he, <laughs> and he's, going to, he's going to tell us how this matters for, uh, for solving uh, AI. All right, so I think since we're trying to catch up on the schedule, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let Jan come up and, and, and talk. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, well, in fact, um, I do give up on a lot of things. So for example, something that's not very well known about Joaquin, unless you are friends with him on Facebook, is that uh, every morning he runs a marathon and sometimes he runs you know, 100 kilometers in the mountains without stopping. Um, so he doesn't give up either. You know, I can run like half a mile before I you know, spit out my lungs. So I do give up sometimes. Um, Right, uh, so I'm gonna, you know, th I'm, I, I realize this is an audience that's kind of probably more industrial than academic, but I'm gonna talk about research. I'm not gonna talk about, you know, what Facebook does with machine learning, although I probably kind of uh, allude to this a little bit. I'm not gonna talk about the past or the present or products we're coming out with that are, we're using everywhere in, in, in Facebook now. I'm gonna talk about like where are the challenges for the future and what are we working on that is, you know, trying to push um, AI to the next level. And so what are the obstacles uh, on the path to AI? Um, and you know, the subtitle is, you know, it's really about unsupervised running. Not just, but in part. Um, in fact, it's about two things, or two or three things. One is, uh, how do we incorporate reasoning and planning into representation learning or, or deep learning? So that's kind of supervised or, or not supervised, depending on, on how you look at it. But that's uh, another big obstacle. That's one of the big obstacles to AI, I think. And there's a lot of people working on this um, at Facebook, at, at Google, uh, DeepMind in particular, and various other places. Um, I think it's a very exciting uh, area, and I'm going to say a few words about this. This is not my work mostly. It's mostly work by other people, but, um, but I'll, I'll say a few words about this. Um, Related to this is how do we incorporate memory into our network? So a lot of the systems that we have built with deep learning are, are sort of you know perceptual system where, which has no have no kind of internal state really. Uh, take an image, you know, produce a label. Um, we of course have recurrent nets that can process uh, sequences, natural language uh, uh, understanding and translation and things like this. Um, but it's still sort of fairly direct. The relation between input and output is fairly direct. Um, and one of the things that um, you know, humans and animals do is remember stuff. So um, in, the, in, the, in the brain, in fact, it's done by a completely separate uh, structure than the cortex. Your, your cortex does computation, if you want, um, and your hippocampus, which is sort of inside uh, uh, the brain, does the kind of storage, short-term storage of, um, of, of, of memory. And those are two completely different structures that operate very, very differently. Um, so there are models now that have been popping up that uh, have this uh, concept as well. Um, and then the last thing is, just how the hell do we do unsupervised running? Um, this is a question that some of us have been interested in in a very, very long time. Um, and when I say some of us, I should, I should say uh, Jeff Hinton. <clears throat> he, he really... Um, has been kind of uh, a big advocate for uh, the idea that the, the ultimate answer to, to AI and, and uh, learning in general resides in better uh, unsupervised learning algorithms. Um, and I was very skeptical at first. We've had, uh, the, I've had this discussion with him for many, many years uh, until he managed to convince me. Um, you know, 
maybe about 15 years ago or so. Um, and I started working really hard on unsupervised learning. And then uh, 10 years later, um, he actually went back to supervised learning and you know, demonstrated brilliantly that you know, uh, there was still some, uh, some mileage to be, get, to be gotten from, from chain rule and backprop. Um, um, you know, of course, I'd been working on this also, but, uh, but it was sort of funny that the, what has created the uh, uh, interest of the industry for, for the renewal of interest for, of the industry for AI and machine learning and, and deep learning uh, is all about supervised learning. It's not unsupervised learning. Um, okay, what I, there's kind of a conspicuous absence in all of this, and it's reinforcement learning. Um, and I gave kind of a similar talk at, at DeepMind, which is sort of the church of uh, reinforcement learning in, in London a few months ago. Um, and I had to make a comment about reinforcement learning. <clears throat> um, I think reinforcement learning is the cherry on the cake. So uh, why is it that we think unsupervised learning is so important? Um, and why reinforcement learning is considerably less important. Um, and, the, and the argument really comes from, uh, from, from Jeff Hinton. It's, it's the following. If you, we're, gonna, we're gonna want to train gigantic neural nets or whatever, very big models with lots and lots of parameters. And we have to feed a lot of information to the systems for all those parameters to get constrained enough. And in reinforcement learning, um, Every so often, not even every, at every sample, but every so often, you give a single scalar value to the, to the system. That's a very, very small amount of information. There's absolutely no way you can train a very large neural net with reinforcement learning unless you run it for millions and millions of, millions of cycles, uh, which is you know, the applications in which it, it's worked. So if you want to emulate the kind of uh, uh, the majority of the learning, if you want, that um, uh, uh, exist in the biological world uh, has to be unsupervised. So unsupervised learning really captures the dependencies in the real world and sort of try to kind of you know figure out the relationship between all the variables we uh, we, we observe. And there are several principles on which we can base this. So I'll come back to this later. Um, so so in the hierarchy of things, um, um, I think that you know how many parameters are being constrained by the different types of learning. Unsupervised learning, I think. Uh, consumes a lot of parameters, so that allows us to train very large neural nets. Supervised learning is expensive because we need to collect lots of label data, and then reinforcement learning is just a cherry on the cake. Um, let me skip this. So, um, so let me talk first about reasoning, and and there are you know how do we integrate reasoning with uh, with with machine learning or with deep learning in particular? So there are several ways, but there is a first question, which is like what's the you know, what's the kind of uh, framework in which you think you know, reasoning can be expressed? And so one, one particular framework is reasoning is you know, something like function minimization. So um, you know, instead of having um, uh, a neural net which basically you, know, you fit it an input, it produces an output, um, the process by which uh, something that is capable of reasoning uh, uh, proceeds is, is that it has two inputs. And what the function computes is some sort of compatibility between those two inputs. One, of course, is, in, is the, uh, the variable you want to predict. Let's call it y. Okay, and x is the one you observe. Um, and so the name of the game here, the inference algorithm, is to find the value of y that uh, minimizes the output uh, of the system. Think of it as an energy function. Internally to the system, you might have latent variables that you also minimize over, things like this. But, um, but that's kind of a detail. And, um, that can be used as the basis for supervised or unsupervised learning, depending on whether uh, the, the y variable is, is one that you observe uh, 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 all the time or, or only on your training set. So, um, so basically, the, the name of the game here, if you want to do reasoning in this kind of form, which is a sort of a simplified uh, or generalized form of, uh, of inference, you know, probabilistic inference is kind of a special case of this, if you want, where the energy function is kind of the log of a probability distribution. Um, so the name of the game there is to uh, shape an energy function uh, that is a function of all the variables you want to capture the dependency of, and shape this energy function so that the minima of this energy function are at the points that you observe uh, in your data. Okay, so let's say we have two variables, x1 and x2, or, or say x and y, and they are related by a quadratic uh, relationship, so uh, y equals x squared, you know, for all our training samples. Those are the blue points that you see here. Uh, what we want is uh, shape some sort of surface 
so that uh, those points are at a minima of that surface uh, so that whenever we know the, the value of one of the variables, we can pretty much predict the, the value or the multiple values of the other variable. And we do this by minimization. That's a process of inference. So now learning uh, comes down to not learning functions, but learning value functions, basically. So that can be useful when you, for example, want to do structure prediction. You want to stick a, a graphical model, a factor graph, or something like this on top of a neural net. And you know, some of us have been doing this for a long time for things like handwriting recognition. Um, but, uh, but there are sort of more modern uh, uh, versions of this for, for applications such as uh, estimating the uh, you know, body pose from, from, a, from a picture. So let's say you have, or, or the, the pose of a hand, for example. So let's say um, we, we have pictures we want to estimate the of the uh, human body. So one thing we could do is uh, detect key points, like uh, the wrist, the uh, elbow, shoulders, et cetera, sort of various parts of the, of the body. And we're going to have false hits, false alarms. Uh, sometimes you know, another person is going to sit next to us, and, and is going to have, uh, you know, we're going to detect the, the wrist of that person or the head of that person. And we're going to have to kind of make a consistent interpretation of what the body pose is. And so a good way to do this is to stick a uh, kind of geometric uh, model of what a human body is supposed to look like and sort of do inference with this. Uh, but of course, you want to integrate this with, a, with a, the learning of the convolutional net or whatever it is that you're using that detects those key, those key points. Uh, so there's an interesting um, uh, work by uh, Jonathan Thompson, who's a student at NYU with uh, Chris Bregler. He's now at, at Google. Um, and where you use convolutional nets to detect those key points and use another convolutional net to kind of do a fine-grained uh, localization and then feed this to uh, some sort of uh, factor graph, graphical model that takes into account the constraints, the geometry constraints of the, of the body and then uh, training the entire thing end-to-end. Uh, -end. Uh, and that produces very, very good results, um, as, as you can see in those, in those examples, uh, pretty much beating the state-of-the-art on every data set that he tried. Um, and it's a very simple graphical model that you use for this. Um, um, if you kind of write it in probabilistic terms, it's a product of various functions, you know, like every factor graph. In fact, if you go to log space, it's a sum. And then you, you figure that when you run the inference algorithm on this, it looks very much like a neural net. The sort of belief propagation algorithm you have to, to run to do, to do this looks very much like a neural net. So let's say you have um, a, pers a person with a gray T-shirt, that could actually be Mark Zuckerberg, but it, I don't think it is. Um, not every person with a gray T-shirt is Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and so let's say you have a detector that um, has uh, figured out where the, the head of the person is. Uh, and of course, there is some sort of distribution for the shoulder should be once you know where the head is. And this is sort of the, the thing you see at the bottom, the, the, this kind of colorful kind of kernel you see at the, um, uh, at, at, the, at the bottom. And so the, the head tells you where the shoulder should be, and the shoulder tells you where the head should be. You have two detectors, which are kind of heat maps for the head and the shoulder. Uh, you kind of convolve them. You convolve the, the head with the, the, uh, the thing that tells you where the shoulder should be, and that gives you kind of a, a prediction for the shoulder would be. And then you multiply that by the, 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 the heat map of the shoulder, um, and, uh, and that gives you kind of a consistent interpretation for that, where the head and the shoulder um, are. Um, and again, that works really well, but I'm not going to bore you with details. Um, okay, so the second question is, is, is memory. So this is a, a little example of how you integrate uh, a very simple form of, of reasoning, and I, I'll come back to this uh, again in more complex examples, but a very simple form of reasoning into kind of a, a deep learning system that learns representation simultaneously with sort of simple form of, um, of, uh, of, of, of reasoning. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to say, but there is really not much more than chain rule in there in terms of math. <clears throat> um, all right, so episodic memory. Um, there is a very interesting series of work that uh, uh, have been uh, done at, uh, at Facebook I Research as well as at uh, DeepMind and, and, and now in a number of uh, different outfits for um, uh, neural nets that are augmented with memory, so re referring to what I was talking about earlier. And the main application of this at the moment is for natural language understanding and natural language processing, although people are starting to use uh, those ideas for, for uh, image understanding as well. Um, um, and it's based on um, uh, a very uh, popular idea these days, which is the idea of embedding things, embedding the world, if you want. Uh, that's what we, uh, 
we, we call these kinds of methods at, uh, at Facebook, uh, embedding the world, which means taking any kind of uh, entity that you encounter, be it an image, a piece of text, a word, uh, even a, a user, a person on Facebook, and representing those entities by vectors. And what that allows you to do is basically compare those vectors um, to see if, for example, a piece of content um, is interesting to a particular person. You compare the vector of that person with the, with the vector of the content, for example. Whether an image and a piece of text uh, talk about the same thing, you compare the vectors, and if they are closed, that probably means they, they talk about the same thing. If, uh, if, uh, if a piece of text is the answer to a particular question, you embed the question, you embed the answer, you compare them, and you can uh, f search the answer to a particular question. So there, there's a lot of really kind of powerful things you can do if you can train a system to represent every entity by a vector, and it turns reasoning into linear algebra, essentially, or algebra, manipulation of vectors. There's a very interesting position paper on this um, that was uh, written by uh, uh, my friend Leon Botou, who is now at Facebook, used to be at Microsoft, uh, called From Machine Reasoning, uh, From Machine Learning to Machine Reasoning. It was uh, published in the Journal of Machine uh, Machine Learning Journal um, a few years ago. And it's the idea that you know, basically you can sort of manipulate concepts as vectors. Um, Jeffington uh, has kind of a similar uh, idea, which, and he calls those vectors the thought vectors, if you want. There's a very simple and popular version of this called word to vec uh, that was um, proposed by uh, uh, Tomasz Mikolov, uh, again, when he was at Google, now he's at Facebook. And, and the idea of this is to embed words. This is building on earlier work by Joshua Bengio and uh, uh, Colobé and Weston, both of whom are on Facebook, um, where the idea there is to find an embedding of words in such a way that you can predict uh, the, the, say, the middle word or the next word in a, in a text from its context, either its uh, preceding words or words around it. And in the process of training this predictor, the, the first stage, if you want, of this network is, is a kind of a, a lookup table that turns every word into a vector. Uh, those vectors tend, tend to have very interesting properties um, that allow to, allow to do things like uh, analogies, where if you take Tokyo and subtract Japan and add Germany, you get Berlin. And so you know, Tokyo is to Japan as Berlin is to Germany. Um, and that just, evol just appears spontaneously when you, when you train word to vec and I'm sure half the room has played with this, because it's, um, it's very, very popular. Um, so, Going beyond this, we can embed uh, sentences, not just, uh, not just text, using commercial nets or recurrent nets based on uh, uh, vector embeddings and, and train the whole thing um, uh, uh, concurrently. And one of the things we can do with this is uh, question answering system. So this is a work by uh, uh, Antoine Board and uh, Jason Weston and Sumi Chopra, where they uh, took a, a, a database, which is basically a, a, you know, a list of entities and relationships, um, and basically embed those uh, uh, entities and relationships. So every pair of nodes in the graph is, is mapped to a vector through a function, um, you know, which takes the word and et cetera. And, um, um, and simultaneously possible questions that can be asked uh, whose answer is present in the, in the, in the graph are also embedded. Um, and the way you train the embedding is that you, you take a data set of generated questions that you know the answer is present in a database, and you train the embedding for the embeddings for, the, for all the relationships and all the questions in such a way that whenever uh, a question and uh, a piece of data in the database uh, match, so a piece of data in the database is the answer to the question that's being asked, you train the embedding so that the vectors are nearby, and when they don't match, you train them so that they are far away from each other. It's actually using a, a sort of more of a ranking loss, where you say, if there is an answer that is not as good as the one that is good, you know, push it away more than, you know, further away than the one that's correct. Um, and, uh, um, and this is, you know, there's a number of loss functions that have been proposed uh, like this to do, to do this, where one of them was proposed by uh, Sammy Benjo and Jason Weston. It's called Wasabi, W-S-A-B-I-E. Uh, so those embedding uh, methods are extremely uh, powerful and popular these days for a lot of applications. And you can use this to you know, answer all kinds of questions, um, um, sort of embed a, a database, a knowledge base, and, and, uh, and embed the, the, the questions that might be asked. Um, let's see. OK, so this idea of representing uh, you know, thoughts or meaning by, uh, by vector is very general. And uh, one of the most interesting demonstrations of the last few, few uh, you know, the last couple of years 
uh, is, is this idea of uh, uh, using, uh, augmenting essentially uh, neural nets with, with memory. Uh, the idea is actually relatively old, and one of the very popular uh, implementations of this is the long short term memory of Reiter and, and Schmiduber um, from, the, from, from the late 90s, which basically um, says that a, a, the, you know, a, a layer in a recurrent net um, should have not just you know, units that, whose function is just a, um, you know, whose state is kind of a simple function of the previous state, but there should be also sort of registers in that, uh, in that state. So uh, a set of units that whose, whose state, if you don't do anything to them, basically stays constant. And, yet, and the, the other units have to uh, you know, produce a particular output to change their state, if you want. So they act like, like registers a little bit. But you can still propagate gradient through them. So, so you can still train this with, with backprop. Um, so the, the next step was um, there's two, two models that, that appeared on archive within three days of each other, um, the memory network. Um, uh, by uh, Jason Weston, Sumit Chopra, and uh, Antoine Bord, which basically augments a recurrent net with uh, associative memory. Um, uh, sort of a soft associative memory, if you want. And the neural Turing machine from, uh, from Alex Graves and his collaborators at DeepMind, uh, which uh, uses a, a memory that is in the form of a tape. And then a few months later, another similar model um, was uh, proposed by Tomasz Mikolov and um, and Armand Joulin at Facebook AI Research in New York, uh, which basically uses a kind of a stack, if you want, or a list as the uh, augmented memory to, to augment the recurrent net. And all of those things kind of serve different purposes, but let me uh, give you an example of how the, the memory network uh, uh, functions. Um, so, um, in fact, I'll show you the architecture first. So, uh, so there is, uh, this is actually the second form of the, of the memory network that we call the end-to-end -end memory network, or, or MEM end-to-end. And, and, and this is a slightly different list of, uh, of, of, uh, of authors here. So what happens is um, you, you feed a question to the system, and the system produces what amounts to an address in the memory. Okay? This address is compared to a bunch of vectors in the memory. So you can think of this as kind of the decoder of the memory, for those of you who are familiar with hardware. Um, and so each of those um, uh, items in the memory kind of produces a score that is kind of a function of how well the address matches the, you know, its corresponding template in the memory. Uh, but it's kind of a soft um, valued uh, vector. And then we use this vector to weigh a linear combination of, uh, of, of memories that have, have been stored in the, in the network. Okay, so it's kind of a soft associative memory or a soft RAM with kind of funny, or a soft hash table if you want. Um, and, and what happens um, when we uh, train this uh, on, on text is that uh, whenever the machine reads a, a piece of text, it uh, finds an embedding for each word or each um, sentence. In fact, it's at the level of a sentence. And it writes those sentences in its memory sequentially. So there's no kind of smart way of deciding whether a sentence is being written in memory. Everything is stored. Everything that is being read. Um, uh, but then the, the machine is trained to answer questions. Uh, so um, and to answer a question, it might have to access the memory multiple times. So it looks like a recurrent net that's been unfolded in time. You, uh, you feed a question, um, you uh, access the memory, uh, get um, kind of a, an answer, and that basically is used again as an address to address the memory again. Uh, you get a second answer, et cetera. You do this uh, a few times. And, um, and you train this entire thing as if it were a recurrent net, basically, to predict the correct answer. You train this on large collections of questions and answers that have been artificially generated. Um, in fact, the, the first version of this was trained with a, sort of a you know, text adventure game simulator kind of thing, where people can move around, pick up objects, drop them, et cetera. Um, and in fact, there is a, a series of uh, questions that, that uh, types of questions that have been kind of listed by, by Jason Weston and, and Tomasz Mikolov and a bunch of other people of kind of the, you know, in sort of increasing levels of complexity. And uh, this, uh, uh, this two versions of this um, uh, MemNN, one where whenever we train the MemNN, we tell it which relevant piece of information uh, uh, needs to be accessed in the memory to answer the question. So it's kind of strongly supervised, if you want. You, you tell it, you know, here is the relevant fact to answer that question, or here are, here are, here are the relevant facts to answer that particular question. And there is the, the, the mem end-to-end, -to -end, the end-to-end -end -end memory network, where you don't tell it, and it kind of figures it, figures it out either, either by gradient descent or sometimes using the reinforced algorithm, which kind of does a search over possible um, uh, items that can be searched. 
And you can do things that are fairly, you know, fairly complicated. Uh, you know, Sam walks into the kitchen, Sam picks up an apple, Sam walks into the bedroom, Sam drops the apple, where is the apple? So you kind of have to keep track of everything. Or Brian is a lion, Julius is a lion, Julius is white, Bernhard is green, what color is Brian? Um, so you know, there's kind of simple inference like this that require like three facts to be kind of put together to be able to answer. Um, and then there is uh, the, the, the cool thing here. So this is uh, Lord of the Rings in 15 sentences, a very shortened version of Lord of the Rings. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie or read the books, don't read the last for a couple sentences because it's a spoiler. Um, but, um, uh, but the system reads this, stores all this in the memory, and then you can ask questions, where is the ring? Where is Bilbo now? Uh, where is Frodo? Or you can ask, you know, where was the ring before Frodo picked it up? Or you know, things of that type. <clears throat> Um, the, um, the, the work by Armand Joulin and Tomasz Mikolov on the stack augmented uh, uh, RNN is, is um, uh, kind of a different approach to the same, to the, a bit of the same problem. And what they're interested in doing is, is grammatical inference. Uh, uh, you know, I'm probably the, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm probably the oldest guy in the room here. Uh, I'm just realizing this. OK, I'm 55. Who is uh, over 55 here? <laughs> Sorry to put you. Of course, Rimonier, of course. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, for those of you who were around in the in the in the 70s, uh, there was a lot of work on what's called structural uh, structural pattern recognition, which basically attempted to use grammatical inference methods to figure out to, how to do pattern recognition. So you encode a pattern into a string of of symbols. And then you try to find a finite state machine or something like that or uh, whatever that kind of accepts all the uh, strings corresponding to a category or object and kind of rejects the ones that are not from this category. It was a complete failure. Um, but, uh, but this is kind of a bit of, of sort of a, a revival of this using sort of more continuous methods if you want to sort of infer uh, uh, grammars. So the, the sentences here that the system are trained on are kind of sequences of, uh, of symbols uh, that are repeated a number of times and system has to count how many times the symbol appears to be able to kind of tell. Uh, whether the, uh, the sentence is, uh, uh, you know, the string of, of symbols belongs to the model. And, you know, uh, regular RNN uh, failed miserably on this. LSTM have a lot of limitations. Uh, they can do add and multiplies. Um, and those stack, stack augmented RNNs seem to be able to uh, do this pretty well and even come up with things like, you know, binary addition and things like that. Um, okay, so enough for reasoning. Let's talk about unsupervised learning now. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have. Eighteen minutes. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so, how the hell do we do unsupervised learning? So, there's sort of two principles that people have been using a lot for unsupervised learning. One is based on reconstruction. The other one is on prediction. So, reconstruction is um, I give you a, a vector, an input, and um, I have a machine that basically tells me I need a machine that tells me if this input looks like anything that was present in the training set. So some sort of energy function, if you want that. Um, you give it an input and it tells you, does it look correct? Does it look like something that actually, uh, um, does it look like a natural image? Does it look like the image of a car? Uh, or something like that, right? Um, and, um, and there are other people who advocate uh, the idea of using prediction as a principle for, for unsupervised learning. So prediction, um, so b before that, so the idea of reconstruction is that the machine inside essentially takes the input, runs through some sort of you know, neural net or whatever that extracts a representation and then reconstructs the input and the energy function that tells you whether the input belongs to the, to the, you know, the, the data set, if you want, is on the manifold of things you trained on, is the reconstruction error. Okay, so that's one, one principle. And then the other principle would be uh, prediction. So that assumes that the signal you observe has some sort of temporal dimension or spatial dimension that you kind of make up. Um, and uh, you, so for example, for video, you show a few frames of, of a video and you ask the system, what is the next frame going to look like? Or what is the world going to look like a minute from now, an hour from now? Um, or more complex, more, even more complex than that, you know, you're watching a Hitchcock movie and you're asking the system, you know, who is the murderer, right? Um, I mean, you have to have pretty high level understanding of what goes on in the pixels to kind of figure this out. Um, and like human relationships and all kinds of stuff, right? So, so prediction is to some extent 
the essence of intelligence. Uh, the, the argument has been made by a lot of people you know, for uh, many, many decades. Um, and and I, I think it's a, it's a good idea. But there is not that much difference between reconstruction and prediction because, um, uh, because you know, predict, predicting the very, very near future is not very different from reconstructing. Um, OK, so the problem is that uh, the, the, the world is essentially partially predictable. Uh, temporarily, uh, if I give you a video and I ask you, you know, of a, a soccer game, for example, and so, you know, the guy is in front of the goals and shoots the, the ball, and then I stop the video and ask you, you know, what's going to happen next? Uh, you have to have a pretty good uh, understanding of the trajectory of the ball to figure out is it going to go in the goals or not. And then, you know, the, 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 the frames a few minutes from, from now are going to be very different because it's going to be one team very happy or one, the other team very happy or not sad. Um, and so, um, so the, the world is, you know, intrinsically unpredictable to some extent. And the problem with this is that if you train a predictor to predict what a frame is going to look like uh, next, uh, the best it can do is kind of predict an average of all the possible things that could happen. And so if you train a, a neural net, for example, to predict the next frame from a video using, say, a convolutional net to look at the previous frames and predict the next frame, what you get is a blurry image. It's kind of the average of all the possible things that could happen. It doesn't work. However, it works for text. In fact, that's exactly what Word2Vec is doing. So Word2Vec and similar techniques or recurrent nets for, for text, uh, net, uh, neural language models, you take a text, you take a few words, and then you ask the system, what's the ne next word going to be? And that actually works. The reason it works is because you can represent a distribution of a word. It's a discrete distribution. It's just a long list of numbers. And we know how to, you know, it's just a vector. We, can, we know how to encode this in our machines. Even if the length of the vector is 100,000, that's not much of a problem. So we can do predictive unsupervised learning on text because the distribution is discrete. But as soon as we go to things like video, um, what we need to do is represent distributions over possible frames in a video. Good luck with that. We don't know how to do that. Um, so that's the problem that we have to solve if we want to really uh, have unsupervised learning systems that work, or at least prediction-based uh, uh, systems. So what a lot of people have done uh, historically is uh, is, is going to stick with a probabilistic in, um, interpretation of you know, the idea that you should predict the distribution of things. Um, but, um, but of course, it's very complicated for, for video. So you have to use models that are not uh, easily normalizable, that are basically intractable. And then you have to use sampling to make sure that you know, your partition function is bounded on that stuff. Um, and and um, you know, it, it doesn't scale very well with the dimension of the, of the space. And uh, you know, thinking of, about this too much uh, made me allergic to sampling. I can't do sampling anymore. It gives me pimples. Um, OK. So there are, um, so let me talk first about the, the sort of reconstruct, reconstruction-based um, uh, unsupervised learning, uh, which um, you know, is this idea of learning an energy function that, you know, embodies the relationship between the variables. Um, so something like, uh, like I was showing earlier, something like this. OK, so now your input has two variables, and you know they're linked by some, some relationship. Uh, and you want to shape an energy function so that it has minima at the points that you observe during training. So that whatever point that you show the machine, it can tell you it looks like the data I've been trained on because its energy is low, or, or it doesn't look like data I've been trained on because its energy is high. Um, and here what I'm showing is the energy surface being shaped by the learning algorithm. It's easy to do in low dimension. OK, so people have thought about a lot of different methods for doing this. And um, um, y you know, I've kind of listed a, a few here. Uh, the first one is you know, build a machine in such a way that the volume of low energy stuff is constant. So the, the, it's very easy to make sure the energy of training samples is low. You just uh, compute the energy for a particular training sample, and you tweak the parameters of the, uh, your energy function so that the energy goes down. Very easy, right? Um, the problem is, how do you make sure that the energy of stuff that is not in the training set is higher? That's the main issue. Um, so if, you're a, a, you know, a probabilistic, if you like probabilistic models, you will call this the, the problem of the you know, partition function, right? How do you make sure that your distribution is normalized, essentially? That's the same problem. So one trick is you just build a machine so that the, the volume of stuff that has low energy is fixed. So things like P PCA, k-means, uh, Gaussian mixture models, uh, square ICA, all those things basically are of that type. Uh, second possibility, you push down on the energy of data points and push up everywhere else. 
Uh, and that's basically maximum likelihood. That's, that's what probabilistic models tell you to do. And of course, that requires a tractable uh, partition function. So you, know, you, you have to be able to integrate the exponential of the energy over the entire domain, which uh, in, in, for all uh, interesting models, you can't really do. Uh, so another trick is push down on the energy of data points and then push up on chosen locations in such a way that the energy takes the right shape. Uh, very often, those chosen locations are, are near training samples. Uh, so you know you push it up so you get a local kind of groove in the energy surface if you want. So contrasted divergence, which you may have heard of uh, from people who use Boson machines, is is one of those. And there's a, a number of others: ratio mat matching, noise contrastive estimation, minimum probability flow. Those are all methods that basically do this: um, make the energy of the points low, and then move a little bit away from it, and make sure the energy is higher, so you get a, you create a local groove in the energy surface. Um, you know, there's a bunch of others. The the, the one I like is uh, number six. Uh, so number six is um, use a regularizer that limits the volume of space that has low energy. So, uh, and one particular embodiment of this is sparse autoencoders. So a sparse autoencoder is a, a neural net, essentially, or a machine, a trainable machine of some kind, where uh, there is an encoder that takes the input, turns it into features, and then there's a decoder that takes those features and reconstructs the input. Um, and the regularizer in the middle says, not all configurations of the, the features are possible. So I want the volume of, of the number of different configurations of the features of the feature vector uh, is limited through a regularizer, for example, a, sparse, uh, a sparsity uh, regularizer. And what that results in is that it limits the volume of stuff that can have low energy. And so automatically, uh, there is you know, a, a limited number of things that can take low energy, which means everything else is, is, is uh, forced to have higher energy, is not being properly reconstructed. So that's the, the basic principle be, behind uh, sparse autoencoders and kind of similar methods. Um, and then there is a, another method that has become very popular, number eight here, adversarial training. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later. So um, in low dimension, it's kind of easy to visualize what's going on. So you have uh, you know, k-means and PCA basically have very low dimensional or kind of low volume areas that can take low energy. Uh, uh, sparse coding is kind of similar, but the volume is not fixed. It's just a, a function of the, the, the sparsity coefficient. Um, but basically, if you have a bunch of points, you know, it, it sort of shapes the space of low energy so that it kind of matches the, the um, OK, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Um, actually, no, I'm going to talk about this a bit. OK, so sparse autoencoders are, sparse autoencoders are kind of a, an interesting set of methods. Oh, no, actually, I'm going to skip. <laughs> There's one thing I want to talk about. Um, this is actually relatively old stuff, so you can find this in papers. Um, you know, this is the idea of kind of using machine learning to learn uh, an optimization algorithm when you have sparse, uh, sparse autoencoders. Here we go. OK. Now, um, one of the things we're interested in, of course, is uh, using um, uh, unsupervised learning to, you, to, to learn invariant features. And the problem is, what kind of invariance uh, does the uh, machine have to, um, to figure out? Um, and you need some sort of supervision for this, or some sort of kind of fake supervision that you can sort of uh, you know, directly derive from the data. Um, so one thing that you might want is um, features that are invariant to shift. You know, it's very natural if you want to do f uh, image recognition. This is what's kind of built into convolutional nets. You, you, um, you, know, you build the pooling uh, layers in such a way that the, the representation after the pooling is relatively invariant to kind of small shifts in the location of the features. So one thing we can do is uh, use unsupervised learning that has this property. So where um, you take the, the input uh, y, you run it through an encoder. Think of it as a neural net with uh, a couple layers. Um, it produces a feature vector. And then you reconstruct linearly by just multiplying by what's called a dictionary matrix. And then uh, measure the reconstruction error. That's, a, that's an autoencoder. Um, so you train those two guys so that the reconstruction error is minimized. But you also have another regularizer. And so here what you do is you do a pooling. Uh, in this case, an L2 pooling. So you take groups of features. You compute the L2 norm of those features, which means the square root of sum of square. Um, and you say, I want the output of those units to be sparse. So basically, you say, um, you know, whatever you do, uh, a, a small number of those pooling units should be on at any one time. And, and you use this as kind of a regularizer when you train the, the entire system. And the result of this is that 
uh, the, the filters kind of organize themselves so that the filters that are within a group whose output feed into one, one pooling area tend to fire together. And two different pools tend to not fire together because that's the best way to maintain the, the sparsity of the output. Um, and you get those kind of beautiful um, sort of topo you know, topographic maps of uh, you know, pooled units that basically are different shifted version of a particular filter, which I'll show you later. There's a number of work that have been done in this area going back a long time. The basic idea for this uh, goes back to uh, uh, Ivarin and Subspace ICA, and there's kind of a lot of work, a uh, long history uh, there for this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, Carl Greger, who was a postdoc in my lab, who's not deep mind, uh, used this method to kind of learn, um, sort of, you know, organize the, the features in the commercial net in sort of a topographic way. Uh, so the, the pooling area here are, are those four by four, uh, sorry, six by six uh, squares where within a square the filters tend to fire together, so they tend to be similar. Um, uh, and, you know, there's some more beautiful pictures of those things. This doesn't work particularly well for like things like image recognition, but it's like it's really cool. And then on the same slide, I can show you know pictures that come from neuroscience papers that show the same stuff. So it makes neuroscientists happy. But it doesn't work, you know. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Um, okay, so here's another idea, which is this adversarial uh, training idea. And again, I'm talking about work by other people here. Um, uh, and a particular model called the Laplacian, Laplacian uh, Generative Adversarial Network, also known as Ice Cream. Okay, there's this idea of generative adversarial network that was proposed by Ian Goodfellow uh, when he was a, a student with uh, Joshua Benjo in Montreal. He's now at Google. Um, and it's a very cute idea. You have a system that is composed of a generator network and a training set. Okay, so a training set is an array. You give it an index, it gives you a sample. The generator network is a neural net. Uh, typically something like a, con like a conventional net or something like this, a neural net. You feed it a random vector and it produces an image, okay? And we're gonna train this generator to produce nice images. That's gonna be our generative model or unsupervised generative model. Um, and you have another network, a discriminator network, and this one trains itself to tell whether the image that's being fed to it is fake or real. Okay, so it's just a two-class classifier. And typically, if you feed images, that also would be a convolutional net. So this guy basically simulates kind of the, you know, is, you know, trains itself to kind of simulate the, you know, the, the perceptual system, if you want, to tell you if an image looks, looks natural or not. Okay, so that's your kind of energy function a little bit, the thing that tells you whether you are on the manifold of real things or outside. Okay, but this guy, the generator network, can cheat. It gets the gradient of the cost function of the discriminator through back propagation. So it gets to cheat and peek at the gradient of the output of this guy with respect to its input. And so it can change its parameter to produce an image that will fool the discriminator, right? And when you train those two things, basically you're optimizing some sort of uh, function and find a saddle point, which is a minimum with respect to the weights of the discriminator and maximum with respect to the weights of the generator. It finds a saddle point it's, it's very unstable, it's very difficult to train these things, but, but you, know, you can make it work. And eventually, um, you know, this thing sort of generates a fake image that this guy can't tell is a fake image. Um, so if you apply this to images directly, it works okay, but it doesn't work that well. There's one uh, uh, interesting idea that was proposed by Emily Denton, who is a student at NYU with uh, Rob Fergus and me. Um, and uh, the paper is uh, as a bunch of people from Facebook, uh, not me. And they used a generator to produce coefficients in a Laplacian pyramid representation of the image. So images are kind of scale invariant, so you can decompose them into, you know, you can take an image, apply a, a, a band pass filter to it that gives you kind of an edge image if you want, and then you subsample the image, pass a, and compute the difference with the previous one, and you know, et cetera. And the, uh, so the, the, the difference between successive subsampled version of the same image is what, what's called a Laplacian pyramid. And they trained uh, a convolutional net, essentially, or multiple convolutional net generators to produce uh, the, those, those kind of edge images, if you want, those Laplacian coefficients in the uh, Laplace transform. Uh, it's not a Laplace transform, the Laplacian pyramid, sorry. Um, and you know, there is a, a discriminator for, for every, every scale. And the multi-scale sort of make it work really beautifully. So there are examples of generated images here. This is, these are low resolution, they're 28 by 28, so it's kind of hard to make out. But you, know, you tell it, you know, you know, draw, me a, draw me a car, and it draws a car, right? Or draw me a, you know, a bird or something, or whatever. Um, and here, um, you, know, you ask it, draw me a church, and you, you know, change the random numbers that come into the generator every time, and every time it generates a different church. 
Um, these are other examples, towers and various things. Okay, so in the uh, zero minute I have left, I, um, I'm going to talk about one thing I'm super excited about. This is a paper that we just posted on Archive. Um, and this is uh, an idea for integrating supervised and unsupervised running. Um, and um, this is, um, the, you know, I'm, I'm very sort of uh, interested by an algorithm that would be seamlessly usable as a supervised algorithm or an unsupervised algorithm. There are existing algorithms that do this already. Uh, the, the best known one is Bolson machines. So a Bolson machine is neither supervised nor unsupervised. It depends on how you use it. The underlying algorithm doesn't care. Um, and it's a very, very nice property. And um, it'd be very nice to find an algorithm that has the same property but that actually works because both, both of machines really don't. Um, and so let's say we have a convolutional net, for example, right? So we, we, have, um, we have an input, so on the, on the left, um, and the input is an image, the output is a label, let's say. Um, uh, that function is many to one. If we want to use unsupervised running based on reconstruction, we need to have a decoder that's going to take the label and then reconstruct the image. But of course, that's a one to many uh, mapping. It's not a function. And so either you have to make it probabilistic, but then you have to use sampling and analogic, or uh, you have to do something else. And the question is what? And the question is this. The, question is, the, uh, the, the, the answer is, uh, or proposal, I guess, is this. Um, and we call this the what, where autoencoder. So whenever you have a, a convolutional net, the, the stage that loses information about the, the input is the, the pooling layer. The pooling layer you know, computes a max over, over an area and basically forgets a little bit about position information. And so that's what makes the function of a stage of a convolutional net not invertible. So what we do here with this wet wear autoencoder is that we, we preserve the information as to where the switches of the max pooling uh, are. And we use that to reconstruct on the way down when we, uh, when we need to do the, the sort of reconstruction. So this is the, an unpooling operation, if you want, that kind of takes the, the, the the, the position of the max switches. And we have to do this in a soft way to be able to uh, train this thing with gradient descent. So instead of a hard max, it's uh, not a soft max because the name is already taken, but kind of a funny form of thing where there is a soft max. You take the values inside of the area that are being pooled, you compute the, the soft max of all those values, and you use those as coefficients in a, uh, in a weighted sum. Um, and you take this guy and you, you, uh, you, you know, this where autoencoder, and you stack it up. You stack a whole bunch of them into a convolutional net. So you can think of this as a convolutional net paired with a deconvolutional net that reconstructs. And it's not a one-to-many mapping because it's got the where information that allows you, allows you to reconstruct. And it actually works. So it actually works in the sense that uh, you can train this with a relatively small number of labeled samples and a large number of unlabeled samples. Whenever you have a labeled sample, you say, um, I know what the desired output is, so I clamp that and I train the, the, the whole thing. So there's reconstruction cost at every layers. Uh, the last one is uh, basically a prediction of the label uh, cost. Uh, and when you don't have uh, a, uh, a, lab a label, when you have an um, unlabeled sample, you just view it, view it as an autoencoder, essentially, and you just run it through. And the interesting thing with this is that you get pretty good results on data sets like uh, STL10 that uh, Andrew and Adam uh, put together, where, in fact, I'm not sure where I got the um, the result with this, but uh, it works well on MNIST, it works well on SVHN, and uh, here's the LCL turn result where um, you know, we get something like 74.8% uh, correct, uh, which is really good for this data set, uh, compared with uh, all kinds of other things. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here because I uh, have, I think, minus five minutes left, and um, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me.